of Mexico. And also I want to acknowledge the support and help from multiple students and colleagues from both the TEMUCC and also um, colleagues at uh, Mission Aransas Estuary Research Reserve at UTMSI. And Texas Commission on Environmental Quality provided historical data. Actually, it was the, the backbone of the study. You know, that's why we initiated it. And the funding to this project was provided by the Center of Sponsored Coastal Ocean Research and OAP program of NOAA. And the trips uh, to these uh, different estuaries were supported by Texas Water Development Board. So my talk will be uh, uh, composed of the following different sections. Uh, first, I want to give you a background, and then I will present a little bit of uh, historical trends in the total alkalinity and pH in the estuaries of uh, northwestern Gulf of Mexico. And then I will um, bring along a couple research questions uh, um, looking at river discharge uh, influence on estuarine carbonate chemistry, and uh, also uh, examine the hypoxia effect on the acidification of the estuarine water. And then just a very um, brief um, overview on the path forward. Okay, so for the background, what is the estuary and why do we care? So the definition for the estuary actually has evolved over the past few decades. And initially, estuary was recognized as a place where seawater mixed with the river water. And then over time, the definition developed because really estuaries are really um, kind of heterogeneous, very diverse. And you know, in addition to mixing, because of the different hydrodynamics, the water can experience um, you know, very different resin time. So um, because of the difference in resin time, actually uh, evaporation could be an important factor in controlling the estuarine water chemistry. So basically here, what I was, uh, I'm gonna talk about today are the estuaries of these types, uh, relatively large estuary surface um, area, but limited water exchange with the coastal ocean. So in this type of estuaries, you could experience both diluted water, seawater, and also uh, hypersaline conditions because of the evaporation. So why do we care about estuarine acidification? I think um, everybody that sits in this uh, webinar probably um, has had a lot of experience, you know, listening to the um, stories on the effect of ocean acidification because ocean acidification as one of the uh, imminent threat to the marine ecosystem has been a pretty hot topic over the past few, a couple of decades. And similarly to ocean acidification, I think estuarine acidification may play a similarly important role. Although, unfortunately, um, given the fact that estuaries are so diverse, so that we still do not know a lot about estuarine and carbon chemistry. Okay, so let me just briefly go over a few factors that uh, affect estuarine carbonate chemistry. So first, because estuaries are initially defined as the place where the seawater meets the river water. So the river water and the seawater, they are considered as two end members. Okay, so then to, uh, for estuarine water, chemistry, really the river water chemistry and ocean water chemistry will play an important role in determining the chemistry of the estuarine waters. Okay, and then uh, in addition to mixing, there's also within estuarine biogeochemical processes, such as uh, primary production and respiration, and also calcium carbonate precipita precipitation and uh, dissolution will both uh, influence the uh, estuarine um, carbonate chemistry, okay? So in examining estuarine chem chemistry, I think alkalinity one is one of the most important factors that we need to be looking at. So before I go into the, the details, uh, let me just uh, briefly define what alkalinity means. So alkalinity basically means acid buffering capacity of natural waters. And to write it in the chemical equation, so this is basically uh, the major component uh, of the alkaline species that can be titrated by acid. And out of these species, the dominant species are the bicarbonate and the carbonate. 
And you can call this as natural antiacid, um, but do not drink water, seawater, if you have heartburn. Okay. And then our clinic is considered as semi-conservative, which means if you have a mixing between river water and seawater, what you would typically get is the linear function, you know, uh, alkalinity will be a linear function of salinity in uh, many estuarine coastal environment and as well as in the oceanic environment. And alkalinity can be affected by the photosynthesis and uh, respiration and, you know, just like uh, earlier, uh, the carbonated precipitation dissolution. And if there's any other acid-based reactions, they will contribute to alkalinity as well. So our clinic is produced during the continental chemical weathering because CO2 in the air, when combined with water, can you know slowly uh, dissolve the rocks and turning that into soluble form and then transport into the river and then into the ocean. And finally, our clinic in the ocean can be removed by the calcium carbonate production. So this is uh, the our clinic record of the uh, Mississippi River. So the reason I bring up this uh, slide is that the river chemistry is changing under different, uh, you know, a variety of different factors. So for example, in Mississippi River, so this is the data I took off uh, from the USGS website. You can see that our alkalinity level in the Mississippi River really varies, you know, by a, a factor of two, you know, even within a very short time period. Okay, and then in the longer term, um, so this actually shows our clinity during the past century uh, demonstrated an increasing trend in Mississippi River. So this is mostly due to you know, uh, agricultural um, practice and also uh, increasing the weathering in the drainage basin of the Mississippi River. So other than changing, you know, increasing alkalinity level in the rivers, there are other rivers that could experience a decrease in the alkalinity export. So this is the slide I took from um, Ad Stats paper. Uh, he's a scientist working in USGS. So he basically summarized a lot of rivers in the country. And then for the Brazos River, um, which is the, where the red arrow is, um, this is the largest river in Texas. And his finding was that the Brazos River has been having a decrease in alkalinity uh, trend over the past few uh, decades. Okay, so that changing river chemistry can affect the uh, estuarine uh, carbonate chemistry. But uh, if I just took a simple simulation, you know, very alkalinity level from 2000 to 3000 uh, micromole per kilogram. Uh, so this represents a century scale increase, which means like over the past half, a, uh, past century, alkalinity increased by, you know, 50%. And then this increase actually leads to a relatively small change in the pH levels in the entire uh, estuarine mixing zone. Okay, and then in terms of the ocean, you know, ocean acidification is a hot topic. And then CO2 uh, input into the ocean because of increasing atmospheric CO2 level can lead to uh, production of carbonic acid. And then this carbonic acid will titrate carbonate ion so that reduce the concentration of the carbonate ion. And the consequence would be that the carbonate saturation state, which is defined in the equation on the bottom, uh, it's basically is a product of calcium ion concentration and car carbonate ion concentration over the solubility constant. So with the reduction of carbonate ion concentration, we would have a decrease in the omega, which is the carbonate saturation state then this actually is one of the driving forces for uh, decreasing omega is the driving force for decrease in calcification in the marine environment. Okay, so in the ocean, um, you know, I just, uh, I was searching for uh, relative, uh, relevant information in the, in the Gulf and the Caribbean region. And this is one of the studies uh, that shows there is a, a long-term relatively, you know, decadal uh, decrease in, in terms of uh, the carbonate saturation state. You can see this, uh, uh, the few panels represent different locations uh, around the Great Caribbean region. So from 1996 to 2006. So there's uh, this uh, decadal decrease of the omega values okay, because of increase in the PCO2 level in the water. And then I contacted uh, Stephen Howden in US 
them a few days ago and asking whether he can uh, supply me with a few uh, slides of his data collected off the coast of uh, Mississippi. So this is also, uh, this data buoy actually is supported by uh, the OEP program. Okay, so from what, what he sent me, you can see this is uh, the seawater, uh, CO2 um, fraction. And actually in the coastal Mississippi, this uh, um, seawater CO2, um, instead of an increase, but it decreased a little bit uh, over the past uh, maybe 10 years uh, since the deployment of this buoy. So really the coastal waters are diverse. However, um, the consensus in the scientific community is that with the increase in CO2 level in the atmosphere, the, the ocean will slowly catch up. And then if we assume that ocean water reach equilibrium with the atmosphere, okay, and then this ocean water gets mixed into the estuaries and compare the pH level in the pre-industrial time when the CO2 level was at 280 micro ppm versus the projected uh, you know, very popular number uh, in the year uh, 2100, the air CO2 fraction uh, reached 800 ppm. So this pH decrease will be about 0.5 to 0.4 to 0.5 pH units. So that is on the right. This is a simulation uh, we did a few years ago. So if you look at the, the black dash lines, this would represent the extent of pH decrease uh, in these uh, three different type of estuaries, uh, you know, influenced by Amazon, Mississippi, and St. John's, which is the, the last one is the small river in the state of Maine. So apparently the ocean change uh, has higher impact on the pH levels in the estuaries based on the simulation, okay? And then not only the CO2 increase in the ocean will decrease the pH in the estuaries, and then it also will decrease the, the carbonate saturation state. And this is a, a simulation that was done by Whitman Miller's group uh, almost a decade ago. And they simulated the omega arachnide, which is the carbonate saturation state for arachnide uh, in the nation's greatest, uh, you know, largest actually uh, estuary at Chesapeake Bay. So on this, uh, um, different uh, curves. The dotted curve um, represent when the atmospheric CO2 was 280, and then with the increase in the CO2 level in the atmosphere, you can see that this uh, uh, omega uh, equal one uh, level, which is uh, equilibrium with the uh, arachnid uh, saturation, will slowly migrate out and out to the uh, coastal ocean. So when it reach uh, 800 ppm for the CO2, the uh, omega equal one uh, isoplath will be right around the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. So really the increase in the ocean water chemistry, I mean CO2 level, will decrease both the pH and the omega value for the estuarine waters. So after uh, we spent some time on this changing the river and changing the ocean, so there's another actually probably stronger effect um, which uh, that can influence the acid-base chemistry in the asteroids, that is uh, the respiration and uh, photosynthesis. So if you follow this uh, reaction that, you know, um, consistent with the Redfield ratio and the photosynthesis, uh, well, first of all, that's the respiration actually, you know, that's the pointing to the respiration direction. So respiration will release strong acid Okay, so that will titrate alkalinity, so which means uh, you're gonna see a little bit of the uh, alkalinity decrease and then uh, increase in the, the total dissolved CO2. So the pH will drop. And then the opposite reaction is the, the back reaction so that photosynthesis will take up acid and then increase the pH of the water. Okay, so to uh, correspond to this, uh, um, change of the carbonate chemistry because of the reactions, uh, you know, actually a perfect example is in Northern Gulf. Um, so the upper left panel shows the historical uh, hypoxia occurrence. Uh, this is a, a long-term study led by uh, Dr. Nancy Reply over, uh, she used to be at LAMCON then moved to LSU. And 
um, back in 2011, uh, Wu Jinkai led a study that examined the pH level as a function of oxygen. So that is the panel on the uh, on the bottom. So you can see with the decreasing uh, oxygen level, that means there is a accumulation of the uh, respiration product. So that will decrease the pH. That's because respiration produces a lot of CO2. And then similarly, in in another large estuary in the nation, the Long Island Sound, uh, this is a study led by um, uh, Chris Gobbler uh, over Stony Brook. You can also see the similar correlation between the dissolved oxygen level and the pH. Okay, so with the decrease in oxygen level, there is a decrease of the pH. So now let's uh, switch our attention to the um, Texas. Um, so look at a little bit of uh, the historical trends in total alkalinity and the pH. And this is a study uh, we done a few years ago. Uh, so basically, uh, it was pretty interesting. I got the data from my colleague, Paul Montonia, and then I kind of uh, was curious to see what the alkalinity would look like over the long term, because this is uh, probably uh, one of the very few uh, long term data set in the estuarine water quality in the country. So then, you know, I just uh, plot the data up and then discover that there is this long-term decrease in both the alkalinity level and the pH level in most of the estuaries uh, along the Texas coast. Okay, so the reason I'll just uh, tell you uh, what I think uh, is happening. So this is another study led by Wei Jun. So he uh, actually um, summarized all the coastal ocean uh, back then, uh, car uh, carbonate chemistry data, and then plotted uh, the uh, coastal uh, alkalinity as a function of salinity. So basically, you can see that from, uh, this is uh, North Atlantic, so from Amazon all the way to Arctic, and then you know the higher uh, alkalinity rivers uh, include Mississippi, Atchafalaya River is in Georgia. Mississippi, of course, is in the Gulf. Okay, and then if we compare this with what we saw in the Texas coast, and this is, uh, I summarized all the river data from the Texas Commission of Environmental Quality. So you can see what we see in the entire North Atlantic West Coast is actually, is a relatively narrow range in the Texas rivers. Okay, so that, you know, figure is uh, pretty dramatic because it really shows how hard, I mean, or how mineral rich the Texas rivers are. Okay, and then if I uh, just uh, put the Texas coast uh, map sideways, you can see if you go to the right of the map, you can see the that's a higher latitude. Higher latitude rivers have relatively lower alkali level, but if you go to the south, you can see higher and higher alkali levels. And another interesting thing that was actually I found on the city's uh, utility department website. And if you look at uh, the total alkaline level in the, our tap water uh, in 2015, so the average was 123. And because this is uh, in the unit of the PPM of uh, calcium carbonate, if you convert this to al alkalinity by multiplying 20, um, so it's actually greater than the seawater on average. So that's pretty striking. So the the thing with uh, asteroids in the Texas coast is that these asteroids really experience uh, increasing evaporation and decreasing precipitation. So on the right panel, uh, these are the data I took from the Texas Water Development Board. And you can see uh, from the northern part of the state all the way to the south, there is almost a, a re reduction of 50% in terms of uh, precipitation. And then for the red bars, that represent evaporation. So if we don't consider the horizontal uh, river input, the precipitation and evaporation will give this type of pattern. So which means if you move to the south, there essentially um, the uh, um, evaporation greatly exceeds the precipitation. So if we consider the river input, uh, you can see that uh, from south, uh, from north, that's on the left side of the panel and then to the south, we'll have the positive estuary and then all the way to the right as, as Laguna Madre, so it's actually an active estuary, so which means there is a, a net freshwater removal in that area. 
and then to the left a little, little bit that New Year's is Corpus Christi and uh, Mission Aransas, uh, you know, relatively stays as kind of a neutral conditions. And then for this asteroids, another thing is uh, because of increasing human activity, so uh, more and more water has been drawn to uh, meet the needs of the people, industry, and agriculture. So um, over the long term, actually, uh, from the past couple of decades, the total water consumption has been uh, leveling off. However, if you look at human consumption, um, that is actually still on the upward trend. Okay. And then in terms of climate change, because you know this is a study just uh, published a few years ago, and you can see that the projection indicates in the long run, this part of the country will continue to experience uh, the decrease in the precipitation overall water input. So combining all these factors together, you can see because the high levels of alkalinity in the river, and then with reduction in the river water into the estuary, naturally, these estuaries will experience a decrease in alkaline levels. Okay, so so that is uh, kind of basically a discussion on why the water input will alter the estuarine water uh, alkalinity levels. And then uh, let's just explore a little bit uh, what uh, other process may be contributing to the alkaline reduction in these estuaries. Okay, so so first then let's come to our uh, research in this region. Okay, so we want to see whether the river change will affect estuarine carbonate chemistry. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And we basically covered four major uh, mid-coast estuaries ranging from the north uh, Lavaca, Colorado estuary to Metcoda Bay, and uh, Guadalupe estuary connected with uh, uh, San Antonio, and then to the south as Mission Aransas. And to the south, that's where we are, is the New Yorkers estuary and Corpus Christi Bay. And you can see that the Corpus Christi Bay and the Rancis Bay, um, they have relatively long water residence time because of a small freshwater inflow. Okay, so their uh, water residence time is around uh, one year. And then if you go to north, and then San Antonio Bay has a, a couple months, and then Metacarda Bay has uh, um, you know, three, four months of uh, water residence time. So this estuary is really that's um, special, they have a small inlets connected to the coastal ocean, and then they have a relatively large uh, the surface area. Okay, so then the resin time basically controlled by the river inflow difference. Okay, so, and I just will, will show you the uh, very um, drastic interannual hydrologic conditions. And you can see here, that's uh, the northernmost estuary uh, Matagorda and the Lavaca, Colorado estuary. And this is average of salinity over time. So actually we started the, the sample collection in the middle of the 2013 and it is still ongoing. And this is what happens to the San Antonio, uh, San Antonio Bay and Guadalupe estuary, and then to the Mission Aransas. And here actually we have a lot denser uh, data res uh, resolution. So that is because we go out uh, every two weeks versus the other estuaries, we basically go out every quarter. Okay, so that is uh, Corpus Christi Bay and U.S. estuary. So if I remove all those error bars, you can see that from the north to south, there is basically an increase in the salinity level. Um, so the green line um, and the blue lines are the two northern estuaries, and then red and purple lines are the estuaries close to where we are. Okay, and then you can see this salinity varies very significantly over the past couple of years. And so that is in the middle of the 2015 and then 16. So these are the two major um, flooding event uh, that depressed our salinity of the estuarine water uh, quite a bit. And actually, probably I don't have to go far. So that is a picture I took uh, back in 2015. Uh, so when those uh, flood happened, uh, that's in my front yard. So. If I see this again, that means the, the salinity in those bays will decrease to pretty low levels. Anyway, so in terms of alkalinity, so here this is a, a temporal plot of the alkalinity levels in these estuaries. You can see that the horizontal line represent what is out there in the Gulf of Mexico. So in the majority of the time, alkalinity level in these estuaries are higher than the Gulf surface water. 
okay? And then when flood happens, really, these different rivers appear to contribute to the Arconi level differently. So the Guadalupe, these uh, red squares are the Guadalupe River and the San Antonio, um, San Antonio Bay, so that you have an uh, increase in the Arconi level. But for the others, it appears that the input of the fresh water will depress the uh, Arconi levels. And then if we look at the pH levels and also the omega, which is a carbonate saturation state, you can see that the uh, flood also influence their uh, distribution, okay? So, at, uh, you know, at times the uh, omega value could approach, approach the one or even less than one uh, when the flood happened. So, and then if we look at the river and member control on the estuarine carbonate chemistry, so basically um, this uh, blue star represents the Gulf uh, of Mexico surface water. And then, you know, the distribution of alkalinity basically shows the, the estuaries actually are showing the pattern that is bracketed by two types of uh, river end members, uh, the high river alkalinity end member and the low river alkalinity end member, okay? Okay, and then above the seawater salinity, we got the upper ceiling conditions. You can see there's quite a bit of the data points falling to the right of the red line. And let's go through a little bit of, uh, you know, basics looking at our alkalinity and distribution in the estuarine system. And this is the river and this is the ocean. So because I said uh, alkalinity, if there's no reaction happening, the alkalinity will be a linear function of the salinity. Okay, so then this would be a mixing line. And along this mixing line, the slope of each point will change as you move toward the seawater salinity, and then actually the slope will be lowest at the seawater end. So your river end member could be you know, as high as this, and you can have another mixing line, okay? So that is, you know, in the perfect world, there's only mixing, but nothing else happens. But in the real estuaries, um, different things can happen, okay? So if for the seawater, only evaporation happens, you could reach hyper ceiling conditions, but the alkalinity and salinity ratio for this hyper ceiling water will not change. So it'll be the same as the ocean water, okay? And then because we are looking at estuaries with very long rendering time, so the mixing in the estuary probably will give you this type of water uh, characteristics if there's no evaporation. And then if you evaporate this water and let it reach hyper ceiling, so you, you're gonna get a different slope of this uh, mixing, um, the ex evaporation precipitation line, okay? So then anything, you know, because theoretically, if it's only mixing and evaporation, you would get all your data point to the left of this mixing um, uh, EP line, evaporation and precipitation line. Then if you see any data point falling to the right, that would indicate the uh, reaction. So this is what we got. So for the seawater, you got evaporation, precipitation, okay? And then uh, that's for the seawater. And then for estuarine water, because of the uh, increase in the resin time, what you could get, probably the real evaporation precipitation line is somewhere here. But then all these data points to the right of this uh, EP line would represent there is alkalinity loss, okay? So then let's look at the data that we collected uh, back in 2014 and is in the manuscript uh, currently still under review. And in the late 2014, there is a, it's, it was a pretty dry period. Okay, so there was a flood in the, in the June and then there was nothing at all afterwards. So in this emission arrangement estuary, we observed a decrease in salinity, uh, alkalinity, but increase in salinity. So if you, think back to the slide previously, if nothing happens, increasing salinity uh, following evaporation would lead to increasing alkalinity instead of a decreasing alkalinity. So this suggests there is alkalinity consumption, okay? So then, because at first I thought, well, there may be a uh, calcium carbonate precipitation because Mission Aransas Estuary is actually a pretty good uh, commercial uh, oyster uh, field ground. 
Okay, so, but for uh, calcium carbonate to precipitate, you're gonna have to follow a certain stoichiometry, which means for every unit of calcium uptake, you're gonna remove two units of alkalinity. So that this uh, so-called delta alkalinity versus delta calcium would have a ratio of two to one. So after correcting for evaporation caused uh, this concentrating effect, which I won't go into very detail. Okay, and then we measure calcium for all the samples we collect. And this is what I got for the regression. So looking at the y-axis is delta alkalinity versus delta calcium. And that's uh, what we saw in the mission arrangements at different locations. And this sign represent calcium carbonate formation, which means there is a far greater al alkalinity removal uh, compared to the amount of calcium removal, which means that there is a relatively small calcium carbonate formation uh, that can uh, compared to the total amount of alkalinity consumption. Okay, so it also appears that, you know, looking at the red, the yellow, and the purple line, these three stations are located in the upper, the three red dots, you know, it's upper estuaries. So these waters are relatively uh, isolated from exchange with the coastal water. Okay, so other than calcium carbonate formation, there must be something else that is going on. Okay. And I hypothesized that, you know, there may be different reasons. One reason could be groundwater. There is uh, sulfide production. So this is a project ongoing, uh, supported by the Texas General Land Office. Oh, there's a typo. And then there could be uh, atmospheric uh, sulfur oxide deposition. Okay, so we have so many refineries here, and also this is a pretty shipping, busy shipping line. If you didn't know, uh, the Corpus Christi Bay, uh, the, the port is uh, ranked number five in the nation. And it could be other natural sources. So now we're collecting the wet and dry precipitation recently. You know, this is uh, some effort we started with uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Dr. David Felix. And also there could be some um, benthic effect if we have a seasonal, you know, resuspension of sediment, it could release reduced sulfur, then can be oxidized to the acid. Okay, and then we're gonna do the incubation in the near future. Okay, so then with original river and ocean mixing, because of if you have flood, then potentially there may be dilution of river uh, alkalinity, and then because of reaction, there may be consumption of alkalinity, so that the new mixing line could indicate that with the combination of a river decrease um, and alkalinity uh, consumption in the estuary, there may be overall reduction in the alkalinity levels. Okay, so this is actually what happens for the flood, sorry, uh, happens in the middle of the 15 and 16, and there is a decrease in the omega values. So take home message for this part is uh, the river change, you know, may be small, but river once it reached the estuary and there is a little, uh, you know, small amount of the exchange or small rate, and then it can stay there for a long time. So it allows time, uh, a lot of reaction to happen over time. Okay, so that really means the change in the river can have a, a profound effect on the estuary uh, geochemistry, biogeochemistry. So this is uh, the second part of my uh, our work is to look at how the hypoxia will affect the uh, um, the uh, coastal bays. Okay, so uh, early on, if you remember, there is a positive correlation between dissolved oxygen and pH in the northern Gulf of Mexico and also in the Long Island Sound. And then in the Corpus Christi Bay, there is uh, you know this uh, hypoxia actually was discovered almost 30 years ago by my colleague, uh, Paul Montagna. So you can see that hypoxia typically happens to the southeast of the Corpus Christi Bay. Okay, and back then they hypothesized that it probably that's because of the high density uh, flow coming off from the Oslo Bay, uh, which is uh, near the, the red area, the bigger red area, and then also the high density water coming from Laguna Madre. Okay, so this is a different mechanism than what's happening in the Northern Gulf of Mexico and also Eastern China Sea. So this is a hypoxic area. And then we just uh, set out and uh, we took a bunch of samples uh, from uh, two summers uh, in 2015 and 16. 
and we collected uh, um, the uh, water samples for quantification of the carbonate system. Okay, and so you can see this is uh, the figure we got from the 2015, and to the left of the panel, it shows uh, the data we, um, from June that's in the surface. And after June flood, you can see to the August, the salinity really increased quite a bit. And for the bottom water though, if you look at this, uh, still the salinity um, looks like to the southeast corner of the bay, there is a higher salinity water coming off from Laguna, so which is right below it. And then along, um, there's also a pretty uh, restricted uh, low oxygen area um, to the east of the high, high salinity water. Okay, and then in this high salinity water, actually the pH and omega values are very high. Okay, so then, you know, because we only took two times and sampled the water, then we went out again. So this is what we got for last year in the summer. Actually, we started in early June and um, ended in late September. So this is the video I'm gonna show you. You can see here on the left, that's the surface water uh, condition. And so, the dissolved oxygen and th this is uh, pH values. Okay, so on the right, that's bottom water conditions. Okay, here we go. So you can see in, well, this is in the middle of the July, you can see there is a very high pH water coming off from Laguna. Okay, and also relatively low oxygen. Go further. So that's to the end of September. Okay. So based on what we got, and if I plot the dissolved oxygen versus pH, and this is uh, then compare with, you know, assumed uh, suppose we have a South Texas shelf water and then let it, let this water go through this aerobic respiration and see what happens to the pH and omega values. And these dashed lines represent what you would expect. Okay, but then for this uh, Corpus Christi Bay water, we actually have seen much higher pH and omega values compared to what you would expect out of the coastal water at similar oxygen conditions. So this means these waters are relatively well buffered compared to the coastal water. And then if we compare the data further with, uh, uh, to the left, the panel shows the comparison between the Corpus Christi Bay and what we've been collecting over the past years in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so the red circles versus the blue crosses. So you can see that even at lower pH, uh, lower oxygen levels, the pH uh, still stayed pretty high. And then if I scale this similarly to what people observed, uh, Chris, the group observed in Long Island Sound, you can see the pH over there is much lower, even, you know, much lower than the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so then let me just show you another video. This is basically a salinity, the top uh, figures and then PCO2 values. So we started from June again. You can see, first off, there is a very low PCO2 level uh, water coming off from Laguna, uh, especially on the bottom. You can see this is the bottom, the right. So here we go. So very low PCO2 and si high salinity water coming off from Laguna. And also these patterns are very variable. So I, I wish I had wind data and probably I'll just uh, incorporate that, uh, the wind data into this plot and show uh, how the wind is driving the water circulation because the waters are really shallow, a couple meters to up to four meters in the Corpus Christi Bay. So wind plays a very important role in driving the circulation. So then if we plot Omega uh, along with the PCO2, you can see really this uh, high, um, Salinity water has high uh, omega value and also low PCO2. Okay, so then bearing this in mind, and I want to uh, just uh, uh, kind of point out what's going on. So this is a, a picture of seagrasses, and 
I couldn't find a picture from, uh, you know, very clear picture like this uh, from the, the locals. So this is actually the picture we took uh, 10 years ago in the Bahamas, more than 10 years ago. So uh, anyways, you just, you just get the idea, but this is actually for this uh, entire uh, Texas coast. Uh, this is a synthesis work led by Ken Danton over UTMSI. You can see this region of Laguna Madre has almost 100% of seagrass coverage. And here, this is the hypoxic region. Okay, and then this is, I think, what happened. And there is a, you know, strong solar radiation here in South Texas. It's pretty hot. It's only um, the seasons are summers and cold fronts. And you have uh, the high solar radiation and also pretty strong wind. And actually, the Corpus Christi is ranked uh, among the top 20s of the windy city in, in the country. So with the high uh, heat and wind, you got a lot of the evaporation. So when the evaporation happens, you, you're gonna increase the density of the water because you get concentrate in seawater. And then this will form the density flow. And this density flow will go to the bottom of the Corpus Christi Bay. And then, you know, because it leads to the stratification so that there is oxygen consumption in the bottom water. So then you're gonna kill the fish or some other animals. And because of the concentrating effect, you're going to increase the calcium concentration in the water. So now another factor when the solar, you know, when the sunlight hit on the seagrass beds, it's going to lead to the photosynthesis. Basically, it's going to take up the CO2 to produce, uh, you know, the seagrass biomass. And this uh, decrease in PCO2 level will increase ca carbonate ion concentration. So that with increase of both calcium concentration and carbonate concentration in the water, there will be an increase in omega and also increase in pH, which is uh, less protons will be available in the water. So in the end, there is a pretty bad hypoxia in the Corpus Christi Bay, but the acidification effect is not as large as one might expect out of the common coastal seawater. And you know, other than that, actually, we're still working on um, to interpret how the also bay outflow play in the formation of the hypoxia. Well, actually, I take the back. The outflow contribute to hypoxia formation, but we're working on to interpret how that's going to affect the carbonate chemistry uh, in the, the broader Corpus Christi Bay. So, you know, regardless, uh, the, the elevated pH uh, and omega even at low oxygen conditions would suggest that hypoxia influence on the estuarine and coastal water CO2 systems. Really, if you look at this issue, they, it have to be determined on the case-by-case -case basis. So I hope this picture won't startle you. Um, I did it to my, one of my students earlier. Um, so Master Yoda uh, said, we must unlearn. Here, we need to relearn what we have learned, and then may the force be with you. So then conclusions, uh, I think I'm running out of time. And basically that is a freshwater inflow will decrease the, the decrease will reduce our clean export to the estuaries and also reduce the buffer capacity. And then the second is with the prolonged water resident time, the consumption of our clean will become very important. And we need to examine the detailed mechanism that leads to the alkalinity consumption. And the last is the hypoxia and acidification correlation. It's a strong, um, you know, there's a significant correlation. However, the decreases of the pH and omega uh, were not as large as the other coastal systems. Okay, so relatively speaking, we're still better buffered. So because of the presence of seagrasses and they give all the good reason to protect the seagrasses. And the path forward is this summer we have a second field season. We're going to go examine three different estrogen types, positive, neutral, and negative, and continue to look at the controlling factors on the carbonate chemistry under these different hydrological conditions. And then we'll examine the alkalinity consumption mechanisms. And also uh, in year three, we're going to carry out modeling, mostly uh, led by uh, Paul Montagna and also colleagues over NOAA. Uh, there is a group. Uh, specialized on modeling. And also, we're working on this uh, General Land Office supported project in the Copano Bay. 
and also the uh, coastal base and actual program uh, so secure funding uh, through EPA and we're actually deployed these uh, two sensors in the mission Aransas in the Aransas SIP channel excuse me so uh, actually we started in last November and these are the data we collected so far and also finally um, we recently received the funding from NSF. We're going to work with the, both undergrad students and uh, high school students to continue looking at actuary acidification issue. And uh, so I want to end with the picture of the aerial uh, view of the university and also our mascot. Uh, his name is Easy. All right, let me just uh, pass on this back to um, Kitty. Excellent. Thanks so much, Dr. Hu. Uh, actually, why don't you keep the, I'm going to pass it back to you so you can keep your slides up in case it's helpful oh. to show slides okay. while anyone has any questions. And I'll just keep my volume on so I can uh, All right. field questions. OK. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and type them in um, the questions box on the right-hand side of the screen. And while people are thinking about their questions and getting them typed in, um, I can start off with a couple. I'm wondering of the different um, mechanisms you suggested that might explain that excess consumption of alkalinity, do you have any idea what, if any of them would be more likely to explain that than others? Um, I think uh Possibly, uh, you know, that's why I actually said I, I was going to do this uh, sediment incubation because this really wind driven um, circulation environment. And when the dry season uh, takes place, it may stir up the sediments, and sediment may preserve the reduced sulfur. So, that is uh, one very likely mechanism that we need to look at. So, this sulfur, once the reduced sulfur, for example, the iron sulfide gets uh, oxidized into the water column, in the water column, and then it's going to release sulfuric acid. So this acid could titrate alkalinity level, I mean, titrate down the alkalinity levels. Oh, that's really interesting. Do you have any um, other data that might support resuspension? Like, does the bay usually get more turbid during high wind events? Um, well, I don't have the turbid data, but uh, I read before that well, uh, you, it's, uh, the water is pretty shallow, actually. It's pretty natural. If you actually in front of university, actually the pic picture you see, if uh, it's windy condition, you would see the water become pretty muddy in the near shore area. So that would you know, kind of a, um, not a scientific uh, support evidence of re uh, increasing resuspension, but I think it's uh, pretty uh, widespread in this entire region. Nice. So Katie, this is Dwight. Can you see the questions? Any questions that were typed in the chat? So I don't see any questions, but there are some. Oh, under the chat box, I see. Yes. Um, how certain are we that the precipitated phase is only calcium carbonate? What effect would adopting high magnesium carbonate phases versus pure calcium carbonate? How would that affect um, the calcium alkalinity slopes? Well, that's a very good question because if you precipitate mag magnesium out of the water column, you're going to get the, for example, calcium carb uh, magnesium carbonate, and that'll reduce the amount of calcium required uh, to uh, combine the alkalinity. However, I think we're going to have to look at the solubility. So the the both the magnesium hydroxide and I think magnesium carbonate, their solubilities are much higher than the uh, arachnide. I think. So that it may not be likely, you know, uh, to precipitate the magnesium carbonate before you form this uh, um, calcium carbonate. But that's only kind of my, my speculation. But that that's something I think we can work on because really titrating magnesium isn't difficult. And here's another interesting question: How much of the apparent sustained carbonate buffer can be attributed to a temperature effect? on saturation state since um, saturation temperature definitely is uh, controlling carbon saturation state and with decreasing in temperature you're going to see the decrease in the omega values um, but here this temperature range in this region is relatively narrow because 
during in the winter we got uh, above 10 degree in very that's most of the time and then to the summer it can go to 30 degree compared to what people would see like in, in northern Asia, you can get pretty low content uh, temperature so that may depress the omega value even further so when you're looking at the effect of the seagrass are you able to take out sort of the effective temperature versus the photosynthesis respiration of the seagrass? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, we, uh, well, the trips were carried out in, the, in June, from June to September when the uh, temperature was pretty uh, high and you know, it's pretty hot even in November. So uh, we didn't consider the temperature effect. Some winter data would be really interesting. Yeah, I agree with you. All right, we've got a couple other questions. Um, someone is curious to know if there are efforts in long-term hydrodynamic ecosystem modeling to investigate estuarine acidification um, in other places in the US or around the world that you're aware of. Mm, well, I, I don't know much about other regions, but I presume uh, with the increasing recognition of the estuarine acidification, there should be effort that need to be put forward on the, you know, study on this topic. Great, and then there's another question. Are there any trends in chemical indices that would indicate problems in calcification of oyster larvae in the settlement phase? You mentioned that some of the bays um, did have extensive oyster fisheries. Yeah, so actually the uh, Copano Bay, which is a part of the Mission Aransas estuary, is actually the southernmost uh, oyster ground. And in the Copano Bay, actually what happens uh, when the large flood uh, rushes into the bay, actually it will basically wipe out, uh, but it's not very frequent, but it can wipe out all the oyster population and then it'll take a few years for the oyster to grow back. So. Part of the reason could be the very low salinity, and uh, you know the water is relatively um, semi-enclosed, and then with this uh, mechanism of this reducing alkalinity level over the longer, you know, long resident time, you could also have these uh, omega implications. You may have, you know, probably compared to the regular river input, and then you have the sudden, well, if you have prolonged drought and then sudden freshwater input, you could depress the omega uh, to a very low level. So sorry, you'll have to remind me, was Copano Bay one of the estuaries where an increase in river flow caused a decrease in saturation state? Yeah, and then it, 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 it is. And then a different one that actually caused an increase in saturation uh, No, that's Copano Bay actually, when you have the large freshwater pass, you're gonna have decrease in the omega. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, the only difference, uh, different region is in the San Antonio, actually, when you have the higher river inflow, that water, the river is relatively larger and then there's actually an increase in the total alkaline level in the entire estuary. Gotcha. Let's see, maybe I'll uh, insert one of my other questions. Uh, it seems pretty clear that changes in river input can be really important for the carbonate chemistry in these estuaries. Yes. Um, do you see much variation in your Gulf of Mexico ocean? And member, I know there's pretty big swings in carbonate chemistry seasonally in the Gulf of Mexico. Does that have much of an impact or as much of an impact on the estuaries as the river flow does? Uh, so you mean seasonal river change on the estuary? I'm thinking the open ocean member. Okay. On the estuary. Does that impact the estuary carbonate chemistry much? Uh, well, open ocean, if you look at, uh, actually it's uh, in uh, one of my early slides. Let me just go back here, uh, show you. Uh, based on the simulation that we did. Slides right now. Sorry? I can't see your slides right oh, now. Oh, you can. Oh, sorry. Let me just uh, share my screen. Great. Okay. So if you look at the, the middle panel, so that's Mississippi River, and then this blue line is uh, the pre-industrial level, and then this pink dashed line is uh, what's going to happen in the year 2100. And then this bl the black dashed line represents how much, well, you're going to have to look at the right axis. That's how much of a pH decrease you would expect out of uh, the, um, um, the seawater acidification. 
So, you know, that's actually essentially the same as everywhere else in the global ocean. When you have this uh, same amount of CO2 increase, you're going to have the, uh, you know, not really exact the same number, but same trend in the seawater uh, pH decrease. And then this the decrease will kind of um, diminish as you approach the freshwater end member. Gotcha. Do you see shorter term changes in the ocean end member affecting the estuary? Shorter term, uh, probably, uh, I think that would be mostly a function of the what is the salinity because really for we started uh, looking at the Gulf uh, from um, almost 10 years ago so so far I don't think other than you know the sea surface if it's offshore it would uh, more or less follow the CO2 level in the atmosphere but uh, that would be what you expect for this uh, 10 year period how much of the CO2 is going to gain in this water but fluctuation, there is, uh, I think, Wijin uh, Tai's group, they published the papers on the seasonal uh, differences in terms of carbonate chemistry in this entire mixing zone. And I can refer you to the paper later on. Uh, I can send you the, the citation. And OK, great. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see. I'm, am I missing any other questions? I guess we're. At about time, Jen, yeah. did you want to wrap things up? Sure, yeah. Um, great presentation. Uh, great job, Dr. Hu. Thank you so much. Uh, if there are no more additional questions, then um, I would like to close up today's webinar with, again, a thank you to Dr. Hu for his wonderful presentation. Well, and, thank you all. Yeah, and thank you to our participants. Keep an eye out for our next webinar scheduled in July. And everyone, enjoy the rest of your day.